All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today for our Pride um, Pride Month speaker. This is something we haven't done every year, but it is something that we'll <laughs> go on the other room. Oh, doing on a regular basis. Let me. Uh, Okay. Just got to mute everybody. There we go. So, Doug, you'll have to unmute yourself. All right. So, um, yeah, we hope to do uh, more of these events. We have a very active employee resource group on campus called Spectrum, and uh, they'll be doing more um, more collaborations with uh, HR. Uh, it's some more great news on campus is uh, the Alumni Association just recognized an official LGBTQ plus alumni club that is called ARC. You may be familiar with GALA that's been unofficially attached uh, for alums of, uh, of Notre Dame, but um, now there's a, an official one that'll start, I think, um, January 1st. So there's some good news, some, some good progress being made. I am proud of our, to have our guest speaker um, today, Doug Botter. Uh, in December 2019, Doug Botter retired from Indiana University, serving as director of the IU Bloomington LGBTQ Plus Culture Center from 1994 to 2019. Uh, campus administrators appointed him to various committees related to diversity and multicultural issues, and he received numerous awards, including the IU Presidential Medal for Distinguished Service. Uh, before his years in higher education, Doug pastored congregations in urban, small town, and rural settings. He worked as a hospice chaplain, volunteered in a hospice setting, and assisted people with physical and mental disabilities. Doug received his Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology in 1971 from Moravian College and his Master's of Divinity in 1975 from Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, Doug currently resides in Bloomington, Indiana with his husband, Marty Siegel, a retired IU professor of informatics. Their family includes four adult children and 10 grandchildren. I won't see all of their names. Um, I had the honor of working with Doug uh, for many years when I was at IU prior to coming to uh, Notre Dame. He was one of my favorite colleagues to work with. Um, we did very innovative, um, impactful programming on campus. I've always wanted to continue to work with him. Uh, he's also a very close friend. And so um, I'm really honored to have him with us. So could we have a warm round of applause, a virtual applause for Mr. Doug Botter. Eric, thank you so much. What a pleasure to be with you and to see a number of happy, pleasant looking faces staring back at me. Um, just a quick overview of what we're gonna do. I, I have just, uh, written a book about my life, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, maybe for 20 minutes. And then really, this is meant to be a discussion with you to ask either any personal questions that you would like or questions uh, related to my work at IU, um, how it might impact things at Notre Dame. Um, again, it's an honor to be, to be with you. Eric uh, was one of the gifts to me at Indiana University. And when he said goodbye to us, many of us were very sad, but we kept thinking how fortunate is Notre Dame to have this guy on their campus. And I realize it's been six years, Eric, but that's great. So what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about the book uh, and, um, and then uh, I'll share a few stories from it. And uh, answer questions after that. So soon after my retirement, I sat down and started to put my life back together in, in written form. I'm 72 years old, so I decided to write a book that encapsulated my life experiences. Um, as it suggests here, the title is The Privilege of Being Queer, A Life of Surprises and Gratitude. It's part memoir, um, but it's also part of gay history and our queer history and people who have read it, particularly young people have said, I didn't know this was going on. And I said, it's not a complete queer historical, it's not an academic piece by any means, but, but I reflect on the things that happened in my own life uh, behind the scenes that were going on 
um, the last 70 years. So people have appreciated that. And in the midst of it, there are a few life lessons. And I wanted to just highlight those three lessons. And then I'll tell stories about that and we'll, and we'll open to questions. So among the things I thought about as I was putting this book together, particularly because I came out a little bit later in life, I was married, pastoring a church, and uh, was already in my 30s when I finally came to terms with being gay. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But the point I wanted to make is that the search for one's identity is a lifelong process. And coming out might be a part of that. It can happen at any time. I've spoken to young people um, in elementary school who know who they are in terms of their sexual orientation, even their gender identity. And I've talked to people in their 60s who are just coming to terms with their sexual orientation. So plus, as I think about my own life, um, my own identity is changing as I move into my 70s. Um, so I wanted to make the point that our search for our identity is an ongoing, lifelong process. And if coming out is a part of it, it can happen at any time. So that's one life lesson. Uh, the second thing I want us to reflect a little bit upon is the fact that all of us have privileges of some kind in some way. Certainly those of you who are privileged to work at uh, an amazing institution like Notre Dame maybe have thought about that. Um, none of us have exclusive privileges, but we all have some privileges. And I'll talk a little bit about how I came to think about being queer as an actual privilege. And I'll get to that in just a moment. And the last life lesson I wanted to leave is sort of a no brainer. And I think many of us have thought about this, but um, my opportunity to work at Indiana University um, and to make a difference in the lives of, I'm told, hundreds of students over the years I was there. It's just amazing to me to think about and to reflect back on. A number of those students have asked for a copy of the book, and it's fun to share that, but I'm, I'm very mindful that my life has made a difference. What a wonderful thing to think about all of you need to consider the same thing. You have stories to tell, and I hope you share them proudly and uh, joyfully with people, whatever your story is. So I wanna go back over those three points then and just share some stories, um, but we'll get back to looking at your wonderful faces as I'm doing that. Um, so the search for one's identity lifetime process. The first chapter of my book is entitled, I Like Ike. And those of you who might be in your 60s or even 70s, if there are any of you out there like that, might remember a president by the name of Dwight Eisenhower. Picture, if you will, a five or six year old little boy on his tricycle riding around the neighborhood with I like Ike stickers on the tricycle and American flags hanging on the flag, on the, on the trike. I had an interest in presidential politics even as a little boy. I'm guessing it was the summer of the second Republican National Convention when Eisenhower was running for, for president again. And I somehow was enamored with the process, with the president, and maybe even as a little boy in a moderately Republican family, um, th thought it was pretty neat to indicate my interest and my support for Dwight Eisenhower. Fast forward 30 years, and I start reading history from a different perspective and realize that this gentleman who was a hero of mine as a little boy is the president who uh, issued an executive order forbidding gay and lesbian people to serve in the United States government. And there's some stories about that in the first chapter, which are pretty upsetting. Um, obviously, the man did some wonderful things, but that is a black mark in my perspective on his time in the presidency. And I, I had no idea about that until I started studying history myself. The same time that I'm riding around in that little tricycle, I'm remembering uh, uh, sitting on the porch of my gr uh, grandparents' house, playing with my year older sister. I was again, five or six years old, my older sister, Connie, and I were playing some game of some kind. My mother was sitting on the steps of the porch. My grandmother was in her rocking chair. 
she looks at my mother and says to her about me, he should have been the girl. She wasn't saying that maliciously. She observed something in me as a little boy that was different. And I've thought back to that moment. I don't know why it came to me, but in the midst of writing this book, I thought of moments that maybe have given an indication that there was something different about me. Even at that young age, my wonderful grandmother, who I dearly loved, and it was just making an observation. I don't remember that my mother said anything in response. She just thought, he should have been the girl. What an interesting comment. Fast forward to my college years, and I'm a freshman, and I'm dating uh, some women at the college that I went to, and I'm also falling in love with my best friend, Hank, and I don't know what to do with that, so I didn't even give attention to it, but I was aware of the fact that when we were double date, I was more interested in Hank than I was with Karen, who uh, was my date at that point in time. Little glimpses along the way that, again, as my grandmother noted, something's different about this guy. I'm in seminary a few years down the road, and I do a paper for the Christian ethics class that I was taking about homosexuality and the way the church was and wasn't dealing with that topic. And I still wasn't dealing with it myself. In college, I was very much involved in anti-war, in civil rights issues, never paying attention to my own struggles or my own issues. And of course, 69, when Stonewall happened, some of you know what Stonewall was. Um, I was just a 19 year old and, and not giving attention. So it wasn't until five years into my marriage that I finally came to terms with the fact that I was more attracted to men than I was to women. It led to a painful divorce. Um, we were fortunate in, uh, I, I was fortunate in, in developing a fine relationship with my former wife as the years wore on, but it was a very difficult time as we separated and divorced, had two children and, uh, and I was pastoring a church. So I took some time off from serving as a pastor to go through all of that um, and eventually came full circle and um, began to be more open um, with folks. So, so that's just a little brief overview of my life. I wanted to talk a little bit about the issue of privilege um, and a story that goes with that. But as I think about the fact that all of us have privileges, you know, it, apart from the obvious that I'm male, and I'm white, and that that gives me all kinds of privilege. There are other things that set me apart, I think, from some people in that I had a very loving family as I was growing up. I had a secure upbringing. I had a wonderful circle of friends. I had talents that I discovered um, and developed through a very fine uh, education. I had a positive uh, Christian faith. I, I grew up in this Protestant tradition called the Moravian Church, which is one of the oldest of the Protestant denominations, but I never had the negative experience that many people who turn out or, or discover that they're queer um, had. I, I had a very positive experience with my faith and an appreciation of the concept of grace, which meant so very much to me, the ability to forgive myself when, when I had to recognize that I, I, I had failed in my marriage and, and that was all very difficult. I also had the privilege of being able to take risks. And um, 10 years after the divorce, I ended up moving to Bloomington to be with my now husband uh, and to come to Bloomington without a, a certain future. Um, it was then in Bloomington that I, I blossomed as it were and gave, uh, it gave me the opportunity to do some incredible work. The moment at which I realized being queer was itself a privilege was while I was still pastoring a little rural congregation in Southern Wisconsin. And um, I had come out to the congregation uh, five years into the pastorate. 
I was doing some work in Madison, Wisconsin uh, on a part-time basis, and I wanted the congregation to know what I was doing. So I told the board, I came out to the board, not being sure where that would lead. And within a few days of that conversation with the board, and they were actually surprised, but some very supportive in their own way. These are folks in a small rural community in Southern Wisconsin, mostly dairy farmers, not highly educated, but wonderful people. I was visiting, I was paying a pastoral call on a couple um, not far from the church. Um, Dolores was facing a hysterectomy and I went to have some prayer and conversation with she and her husband before um, she entered the hospital. And in the midst of our conversation, this was soon after I'd come out to the board where her husband was a, a member, they started, both of them started weeping and I didn't think it was related to her entering in the hospital. And I said, can you tell me what's happening here? And the story they told me was they had a son who had uh, gotten a young girl pre pregnant many, many, many years before this. And they never told anyone this story. They immediately got married, the couple, the, the son and his fiance at that time. And the struggle that Dolores and her husband were worried about was, was it appropriate them for them to love this child born out of wedlock as much uh, as the, the children who are born after they were married. This was a theological issue that was very real for them. And they had never told anyone. They said, we could never have told our pastor at that time. No one in our family knows this. We told this to you because you were honest with us about one of your struggles in life. And it was at that moment that I knew being honest about being a gay man would lead me to um, have opportunities um, to care for people in unique ways. It, it, was, it, was, it was a God moment for me, a moment in which I re realized that um, being queer, as it were, maybe was a privilege and would open doors for me. And from that moment on, I was not afraid to be honest. I was able to help uh, people in our church deal with this issue. And then on to IU where um, I, I also had a, an opportunity to help many people. The interesting thing, and this is the last point I'll make here about one person making a difference. In, in the depths of my despair, in the midst of the divorce, not long after thinking I might take my life, I met with a spiritual mentor who happened to be a bishop in the Moravian church. And I talked to him about being gay. There was no condemnation at all. He looked at me and said, Doug, I know this about you. And being gay is one of life's dynamics. And I looked at him and said, one of life's dynamics? That's not how many people see it. This was back in the early 80s. And I said, it's certainly not how the church sees it. He said, well, it's how I see it. And I actually was hoping you might be the person to bring our church into the 20th century and to help us to deal with this issue. Well, I didn't want to hear it at that point. I, it was too much to even contemplate that I would end up at Indiana University, one of the premier institutions in the country in dealing with sexual orientation because of a, an entity there known as the Kinsey Institute, uh, which has given uh, credence to uh, studies of reproduction and sexual orientation and all sorts of things. I would end up there and have an opportunity for 25 years to direct the LGBT center. I, I never imagined that would happen, but Milo, the bishop, in his wish for me and in his vision for the church uh, knew what he was talking about. And um, I have indeed had the opportunity to make a difference. Um, and I really know and believe that every one of us has an opportunity to impact people's lives and to make a difference. I wanted to close this portion with um, the last page of the book. I found a prayer many years ago. It was apparently written in the 80s by a sister, Ruth 
Marlene Fox. I don't know if her name is familiar to any of you, but we found this prayer and I had it quietly displayed in my office on the campus for many, many years. Knowing that religion was um, a difficult thing for many people who struggled with issues of sexual orientation and gender identity, I didn't have it prominent on the walls, but I had it there to remind me of what my call was in the work that I was doing at IU. And this is the prayer. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And lastly, may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. For 25 years, I had an opportunity to do some things that um, I know when the office opened at IU, people didn't think it could happen, but we were able to make a difference. I was able to work with people like Eric to make a difference in regards to all sorts of diversity issues on the campus. And now he's yours to enjoy. And, um, and I know how many of you are helping him to do that in that place. Again, it's a privilege to be with you today. That's a little bit of my story. And um, we really wanted this to be a discussion. So I see a couple messages in chat and Eric, you're gonna sort of monitor questions and I'll try and give some answers. I will. Thank you, Doug. So. There's two ways you can ask a question. You can just get my attention. You can raise your hand this way. You can also um, raise your hand in the reactions and then your picture will populate to the top of my screen and I can acknowledge you. You can raise your, uh, raise your question there. Or if you wanted an anonymous or confidential question, you can direct message me. Um, we do have one that's some that just came through. Um, all right. Uh, how do you discuss this topic with someone who believes it is nurture rather than nature? Um, for example, it's a choice to be gay or queer. Um, it's not a point I want to argue with people, but I have had this conversation and I try and explain to people that I, one of the quotes in my book, and it's sort of meant to be funny, was that I didn't choose to be gay. I just got lucky. Now that's not going to work well with people who argue the nurture nature. What I explain to people is that as long as I, you know, going back to that moment with my grandmother, I didn't know then that I was gay, but I, I knew at an early age that I was different. So I really believe this is who God made me to be. Um, that's my experience. Um, and um, so my point isn't to argue with people, is simply to say what I chose was to be honest. And it took me a long time to be honest with people about who I knew myself to be. Again, there were inklings, as I told you earlier, along the way of where my attractions were um, from a emotional and um, sexual uh, perspective. Um, so I, I use my own life experience as my authority, as it were. I know people who disagree with that and, and think someone made me gay or I decided to be gay one day, which is not the case. I decided to be honest one day. Um, and, um, and that's sort of how I respond to the nurture versus nature. I, um, and there will be people who will disagree with me, but uh, all I can do and all I encourage other people to do is to be true to themselves and to tell their story as, as honestly as they can. Thank you, Doug. So one thing I would add is uh, <clears throat> as I started doing workshops and um, more diversity and inclusion programming, uh, I, I did bring Julian Glover to uh, as a, as an educator a few times, um, maybe 200 people have um, saw uh, her speak. 
And, um, but I, I have gotten some criticism, like how, why are we talking about LGBT issues, LGBTQ plus issues at, at Notre Dame or a Catholic institution? And like you, I, I never challenge someone's spirituality or their religious beliefs. Um, but what I can say is uh, there, a major premise of Catholic doctrine is to treat each human, uh, each person with human dignity and respect that we are all made in the image of God. I feel like, how can you mistreat someone who's made in the image of God? Um, I also say, you know, what you do at home, what you think at home is your business, but how you treat people at Notre Dame is our business. So I'm trying to create a campus climate that's conducive for everyone to do their best work. We don't always have to agree, but we have to treat each other well, even when we disagree. And that's very much the, the um, perspective we use at IU, even though it's a, not a religious, obviously a public institution, but you know, you have a right to believe that I'm going to hell, if that's your belief system. Uh, you don't have a right to make my life a hell um, here on this campus. And there were people who would who, who we, as we know, Eric, because we worked on a team together, who harassed the students. And sometimes in their mind, it was in the name of religion. Mm -hmm. And that was not um, allowed or not, in, uh, you know, the, the university had policies against that. So again, it was about respecting people. Um, I'm not here to argue uh, theology. I can't, I really can't. It doesn't do any good to throw Bible verses at people. Um, I have my own way of understanding scripture and um, uh, it may or may not be right, but um, it's, it's based on my understanding of God in my own life. I have another question from the chat. What are some of the barriers you faced at IU and how did you go about breaking them? Um, one of God's gifts to me, I think, is the um, ability to listen. Um, and uh, to network, I, I, I believe uh, one of the things I was able to do was to um, develop relationships and relationships of trust. Um, Eric and I worked closely together uh, for a number of years. I also had the privilege of working with um, the, the directors of all the cultural centers to make it clear that I wasn't just a one issue person. I, can, I was concerned about a host of diversity issues. Um, as a person of faith, I took time to meet with religious groups on the campus, with religious leaders on the campus. Um, like the first year or two, the office was established because there was so much controversy surrounding the office. Um, this is 1994 and the state legislature was refusing uh, to support this. In fact, they were threatening the university with um, uh, they were going to cut back on the funding of the university if they opened this office, uh, the tune of $50,000 or some such figure they were going to uh, cut from the state budget. And uh, so there was controversy. Um, I met with some of those legislators. Um, Bloomington, as you might know, is a very, I guess we'll use the term, a relatively progressive community. So I made... Uh, time to visit with, you know, the director of the Human Rights Commission in town and with uh, political leaders and with people in the school system, principals. And uh, we had a speakers bureau that uh, spoke to a number of uh, entities around the city, um, schools, uh, church groups. Um, most any time there was an opportunity to either tell my story or to encourage other people to tell theirs, um, that seemed to make a difference. And in fact, um, sharing something of my story would often lead other people to share their stories. And often they'd be people in that church or in that classroom. And so I think the whole matter of being honest about who we are and sharing our own stories often made a difference. Um, <laughs> There were, there were fewer barriers than I imagined when I started the job. Yes, initially there were state legislators who were very much against us, but that actually brought a lot of people out of the woodwork in support of us. So um, again, IU is, is a unique uh, place. Um, Eric knows the story that over the years we probably had 
two to 300 campuses around the country ask, how did you get an office like this going at IU in the 1990s? And the question they always ended with was, how did you do this in Indiana? And in latter years, the question I would, or the, the response I would give was, you need to stop thinking Mike Pence and you need to start thinking Pete Buttigieg. And people understood right away that not everyone in Indiana, you know, had a certain political bent about them, that, that it's a place with a variety of, of views. And again, IU was fortunate to having, have a dear friend of Father Hesburgh named Herman Wells, who made a huge impact on the IU campus um, and on the community of, of Bloomington, a very progressive and liberal person. And then you had the Kinsey Institute. So I would often encourage campuses to think about who are the advocates or the allies in your community or on your campus who can help you with this. Um, stop thinking Mike Pence, start thinking Pete Buttigieg. You all know what that means. All right, we have two more questions. One in the chat that came first, and then we'll go to Maureen after that. So you're okay. next, Maureen, I promise. So what was the culture like for LGBTQ plus students, staff, and faculty when you arrived at IU Bloomington? And how did you go about changing that culture? And there's more. Um, at ND, many people that participate in Spectrum, for example, um, our LGBTQ plus and ally employees resource group wish to remain anonymous because they are not comfortable being openly gay or even openly an ally on campus. What suggestions do you have for changing this culture? Um, I think this conversation is one step. So how did you, how was it at IUB? What did you do? And what suggestions do you have for us at Notre Dame? Yeah, um, I guess the reason I wrote my book was the stories of our lives make a difference in the lives of others. And so I, I told my story to a lot of people. Um, uh, I, I knew the Dean of Students in hiring me was hoping I could speak to the issue of religion, particularly as politicians through, the, uh, through religious issues around um, in ways that I would have thought were inappropriate. But um, my, my point is that um, encouraging people to come out when they were able and to be honest with themselves and with other people I think the very fact that the university had an office like this with a sign in the front of the building indicated that there was support on this campus. And as people came into the office or called the office and said, could I meet with someone? It was about giving people the courage to be themselves. Um, and not everyone can, be, uh, can, can, can do that at a particular point in time. Back to my first point that coming out is a can happen at any time in a person's life. But I think giving people symbols or uh, role models of people who can be open, uh, obviously Pete Buttigieg is a huge uh, role model for people in your community. Um, and, um, and, and so I think encouraging role models is, is really important. Um, I was mentioning to Eric yesterday, I remember years ago when there was a group meeting on your campus, but they weren't meeting on the campus. Um, it, was, it was a group of queer students who wanted to do a film festival and they were calling different campuses uh, to support their effort. And we had a group of students come up and attend the film festival, but it was held off campus. This was before the days of Spectrum or any of the other groups that are happening on campus. Each of those steps will um, embolden or encourage uh, some students to be more open um, or maybe some faculty or staff to be more open, to have um, symbols of, of, a, of a group on the campus, um, maybe a clergy person in the community who's an ally. Um, the more those people can be out spokespersons, um, the easier it is for, for people to be honest. I, I, I don't know a better way. Um, someone has said that um, coming out is the most political act anyone can do. Well, it, it's often a very personal act. And yet that's what changes minds when people tell their stories about who they are 
and how they want to live their lives. Um, but it's a process and it was a tedious process at IU. It certainly didn't happen overnight. Yes, it was a relatively open community, but we spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people, gathering as much support as we could sort of day after day after day. And folks are still doing that. Um, but it, it, it made a difference over time. Right, thank you so much, Doug. Maureen. Hi, Doug, thanks so much for doing this. Um, so Carl Nassib, I don't know, the NFL player that recently came out, um, he mentioned uh, that he, he wishes that he never had to come out, that that was not, you know, something that people had to do. But it sounds like for you that was, you know, such an important part of your life and an important step in conversation. So, you know, I know that it's obviously a very personal decision, but do you think that, you know, going forward, you, your hope is that people will not have to come out or like, I don't know. Yeah. That's a great question, Maureen. And I, I, I heard, I heard the, um, the struggle in his, you know, coming out process, but knowing that at this point in time, it's still important, particularly in, in a place like the NFL to say, um, I am gay and I want people to know that. And the response from the NFL is amazing. As I think back to when I was first coming out, I was living in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And the, the, the sign of hope for me was reading a book by an, uh, an athlete named David Cope, who used to play for the Packers. But he was, he was retired and he came out later in life. Um, it's been years since anyone playing um, has been able to, you know, make that statement. Um, yes, I hope there's a time where this just isn't necessary anymore, but we're not there yet. And so that was significant um, for him to do that. What was equally significant is the way uh, the teammates responded and the way the NFL uh, supported his gift to the Trevor Project, which you might know about, um, provide support for kids um, who are um, suicidal, um, who identify as queer, and, um, and the NFL uh, matched his gift. Uh, so there's a growing awareness that this is an issue that needs to be addressed in compassionate uh, ways. And um, yes, I hope 10 years from now, that sort of thing just isn't necessary. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Where is your book available? I don't, uh, see, it. I don't see it on Amazon. It's not, an, uh, uh, we decided to print it ourselves. And so I think, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, what we've decided to do is people can email me and um, we're gonna make uh, them available through your office. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, it, so people can, email you, you can respond with a, a bill or whatever, but you'll send them all to my office and then people can pick their copies up. It'll make it easier on you from shipping since you're, you're not a publisher. Um, so you don't have to ship uh, a lot of books, but um, if, if anyone's interested, they can email you and uh, go from and we'll, there. Yeah, I'll compose a list. I'll let you know. I think we're, we're, asking uh, $12.50 for the book, uh, $12.50 to cover. Um, it, it's not a huge volume. It's what, uh, 150 pages, I guess. Um, so it's easy to, we'll, we'll get a batch to, uh, to Eric and he can distribute them through his office. This was not meant to be a, uh, a, a book uh, selling uh, conversation as it were, I, it just, it was really important for me to tell my story in this way. Um, and when I, and I sent a copy to dear friends, Eric got one and he said, I want you to tell your story here. So um, I'm, I'm happy to get some copies uh, to Notre Dame, but um, I'm not, um, th this is not pushing you all to buy the book. Thanks, Doug. We had another question asking about the prayer um, that you, the poem that you read, but uh, Kerry Kesabata, our chief of police, uh, put a link to the <laughs> to it in the chat. So terrific! Um, yeah. I, I did not know. I it was 
I think it had appeared in a church newsletter without giving credit to uh, Sister Fox. Um, and it was my partner, Marty, who in uh, formatting the book said we ought to give credit and found her name and, and the good work that she did associated with that prayer. So I take no credit for it. Um, so glad you found that link. Um, I just, it's one of the more powerful prayers. And, and as I say, it, it was, um, it was an inspiration me from day to day when Eric would come in the office, he didn't know, but if I closed the door, that's where the prayer was. And it was a daily reminder of, uh, what for me felt like a, a, a ministry in every sense of the word. Um, so I'm glad you found it. Thank you for, for uh, adding that to the chat. We've got two more. I'm going to go to the chat and then we'll come to Anne, whose hand is up. So from the chat, um, it says, thank you so much for hosting. Um, in my personal experience, uh, maybe not for everyone, Notre Dame is awesome, but also is a place with very traditional expectations of gender expression, et cetera, which can be daunting for trans or non-binary folks. I'm wondering if Doug has any advice for individuals trying to navigate that in the workplace who are um, trying to be more open with expression or how to make pronoun sharing more common in departments where um, it is not, for example. That's a really important and really tough question to answer. My sense is we're just beginning to deal with issues of gender identity and the way we dealt with issues of sexual orientation some years ago. So we're kind of on the cutting edge of this. And um, uh, Eric, I think you shared that there's some discussion about uh, benefits for trans individuals at, mm -hmm. um, at Notre Dame. This is a process and it's, and it's probably no more important uh, for people who are able to share their journey about being trans. It took me quite some time to understand how this was not the same as, but similar to issues of sexual orientation and how we needed to work with our trans brothers and sisters um, in, in creating equity and equality for them. But again, as people shared their stories with me about transitioning or their desire to transition, it began to make sense. And so any forums you can host, any opportunities you can have to have trans individuals share their story. I, I was mentioning Eric, when we talked to uh, Jonathan Capehart did a special the other night on MSNBC about those individuals who are serving the Biden administration. And unbeknownst to me, there is a trans woman, um, a physician who was featured on that broadcast, who's in the administration, a brilliant woman. Um, and just seeing and hearing her, again, begins to normalize this issue. And so as people, uh, again, step forward and share their stories and their needs for um, equity, um, I think trans individuals are uh, experiencing more violence in our culture than uh, particularly black trans individuals than any other single group. Um, so that's, that's an issue for the church to address and for Notre Dame to address, but it, um, there's no easy answer to how to do that, uh, except to work with people like you and like-minded people. And I think those people, allies come on board when someone has the courage to say, here's who I am, here's my issues, you know, I've struggled with this all of my life. I'm at peace now as a trans individual. Um, and, and there are more and more people who are willing to do that. So they are the heroes and heroines today uh, who are helping the, the rest of us. It's not an easy issue to understand. All right. Thank you, Doug. Anne. Yes. Thank you, Eric. So we were talking about uh, public figures and also maybe people we know more closely coming up. And my question is a little bit about, as an ally, what's the most respectful and effective way of giving them support? Do we wanna public, publicly support their coming out? I mean, are we almost um, perpetrating a celebration of what should be a most, the most normal thing, right? At, at what point are we, um, adding oil to fire by making this such a public event when really it should be a private decision 
and it shouldn't be a big deal. I don't know if I'm, I, I hope I'm conveying my question, no. but I, I, at what point are we sort of, this is, this is normal. This is not something that, you know, should be such a big deal. Um, yeah. You know what, if you were my friend, which you just became, um, and, and we were having a conversation, I, you, you would, I would want you to ask me that question. It could remain a private issue between the two of us. If you just said, I'm learning more about, you know, LGBTQ plus issues. And I want to be, I, if, assuming you have some people maybe who've come out to you, how can I, how can I be most supportive of you? What, what would you like? There are people who will say, just keep being my friend. And there are other people who say, would you march with me in the parade? And you may be able to do that and you may not, but people have various responses to that. But I think your sincerity in just asking that question of someone um, will be a huge gift. Um, that's, uh, that's been my experience at least, you know, you don't have to make a big issue of it if, if they're not making a big issue of it. But, you know, um, there are still people who struggle within their families or within their faith communities or whatever, and just have someone to talk to, you, you open the door for that to happen by saying, I wanna be supportive. I don't know quite how to do that or what would be most helpful for you. And, you know, you might have two gay friends and their responses to that would be very different. So just allow your sincere heart to, to, to um, ask the question and, and listen. Mm -hmm. That's Thank my you. best advice. It's a great Thank question. Thank you. Okay. How can parents of LGBTQ plus children best support them? Um, so afraid of a life of discrimination. Yeah. Um, there's a wonderful organization called Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And um, I don't know if there's an organization in, in uh, South Bend, but there are wonderful resources online. Um, if you just uh, Google PFLAG, P-F-L-A-G dot org, um, they can tell parents how to be supportive. My, in talking to parents over the years, my point would be ask questions in a non-judgmental way and, um, and listen. Allow your son and daughter to tell um, their struggle to you and ask how, uh, as we were saying, as I was saying to Anne, how can I be supportive? Help me to understand. I don't understand this. Um, and many parents are still responding did I do something wrong or what did I do wrong? And um, the, the answer most typically is you didn't do anything wrong. I, I just, I'm needing to share my story with you. Listen, ask questions in, in a respectful way and listen and learn. There are so many resources out there. Um, and if in fact um, parents have friends who are gay or lesbian, uh, Ask them how they can be supportive as parents. Often, you know, um, adult uh, gay and lesbian colleagues or friends can be of some help along the way. But don't be afraid to listen to your, your, your children. <clears throat> yes, children can be confused about issues, but when they're at the point of coming out about their orientation or their gender identity, they're not playing games. They want someone to understand and to listen to them. and. Um, and, and there are other resources. You don't have to do this alone. There are other parents out there who've been this journey. There are professionals, both clergy persons and, um, you know, a counseling individuals who can help along the way. But um, so much of it is about listening in, in non-judgmental ways. Excellent. People posted that we have a local chapter of PFLAG. Ah, right? so there's great. The, You're the lucky. Um, also, uh, uh, Christopher, who is uh, an excellent resource on campus, uh, he says one way we can help support is to add our pronouns to our email signature, our name on Zoom. It, it's been on my email signature for about two years. Zoom, it keeps a race name. When I put it on there and then I log in again, it's not there, but uh, I'll keep working on it. But what that does is normalize us talking about our pronouns. And so if someone is transgender, um, if they're the only ones that list their pronouns, then people know that, oh, that's a, a different case. But if we all have our gender pronouns in our signature, it normalizes it. And um, it's just, so anybody who does that, it's just a normal thing, if that makes sense. It doesn't bring attention to 
um, to our trans uh, friends or coworkers. But again, if people do that, um, it's not inappropriate to say, help me understand why the pronoun they is important to you. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's not gonna be the same answer from everyone, but you will gain some insight and some understanding if your colleague or your friend or even your child is asking to use this particular pronoun. Is, is, is Christopher the, the gentleman with the uh, rainbow shamrocks behind him? Um, I can't. Yes, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I should have my um, pronouns up there. I, I, I'm, I'm so old that I forget to do that. But that is a, it's a symbolic thing, but it's very helpful. Um, I can again. actually provide um, um, a tip. Um, Eric, your yeah. Zoom um, is this the, the name in your Zoom is disappearing because you have to go to a main account, zoom.nd.edu. That's your main Zoom identity portal. And that's where you need to add your pronouns in there. And this okay. will be global. Every time you log in, your name will show as with those pronouns. So just Thank wanted you. to let everyone know in case you were ever wondering how to do that. Thank that's you really very awesome. much. I'm so glad to know there are people there helping Eric out because he doesn't have all the answers. He has a lot but good for you. And this reminds me that among this group that I'm looking at today, I'm sure there are lots of resources among you. Don't minimize the skills you have, the insights you have, the good questions you have, and keep asking them of each other. That's how we make progress. Um, and if, if this is a, a chance to, to continue that conversation among this wonderful bunch of colleagues, hooray, that's great. Eric, we're, we're close to the hour. Yeah, we may have one more. Let's see. Um, all right. Uh, what, what advice would you give to children who grew up Catholic and have come out as gay? They feel like they have no choice but to leave their faith. This seems to cause difficulty with Catholic families who are supportive of their children. Uh, so one thing I would I would say, Doug, and then I'll hand it over to you, is we, we do have a staff chaplain, um, Father Jim Brackey, who is absolutely amazing. I love him. But whenever he speaks, he says, I am the chaplain for those of, of all faiths or no faith. Um, and he's so inclusive. He is a Catholic priest but he is so inclusive and open with other people. He may be an excellent resource to touch bases with um, our staff chaplain, uh, Father Jim Brackey. All right, Doug, do you wanna add something? No, I mean, you. That's thank you for that. It just seems to me, as long as I've struggled with this issue, even from a faith perspective, there have been Catholic voices um, on the national scene, now on websites, um, in local parishes, um, the Pope's a pretty good example, in my estimation, of, of the church growing in their understanding of this issue. So uh, I, it's, it's not a cut and dried issue. There are Catholic voices of compassion and care um, that people need to find. And that's true of Protestant churches, um, uh, any other religion. You seek, you seek out those folks whose heart and whose voices you know are speaking out of compassion um, and not a, a more legalistic standpoint. I, I, um, you know, I don't, I don't wanna argue Catholic theology. There, there, I'm sure there are people even listening in here who have various viewpoints, but to note that you have a chaplain on campus who's, who would be a, a, a willing shoulder to lean on or a voice to turn to, um, that's been my experience since the since I came out in the 80s, that there always was a, I'm trying to remember that there was an integrity and dignity group in the old days. Um, and it, you know, I read a number of books by theologians when I was coming out. And one of the best was by a Catholic theologian whose name I forget, but um, there are some great resources out there. Um, you know, I would, I would Google gay friendly, Catholic voices or something like that. 
and there are authors out there who could give perspective and, and a point of reference uh, for families to discuss this issue. It's such an important question. Yeah. And the church is coming to terms, but some more slowly than others. And people are posting links to different books and resources in the chat. So that- Terrific. That absolutely this is such a great example, Eric, of the resources yeah. you have among yourselves there. This is wonderful. Yeah, I, I would say, um, and not just on, on LGBTQ plus issues, but issues of race and, and difference, diversity and inclusion, Notre Dame is such an exciting place to be right now. Uh, there's committees and councils popping up all over campus in the colleges and different departments. Um, we're collaborating, we're working together. There's um, individuals, when we have a speaker like you um, that, that just are dying to hear more and learn more, um, and there's just such a, a hunger to, um, to be more well-rounded on these issues. And so there's been a lot of uh, resources shared and um, different speakers that are coming in and we always have an amazing um, turnout. So I'm really grateful uh, to be here and grateful for Notre Dame, it's, especially at this time. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here. Eric, am I remembering correctly that Father Hesburgh was there when you moved to Notre Dame? Yes, I, okay. I got to meet him. I moved here. Uh, I started December 1st in um, 2014, and I met him two weeks later, and then he passed away two months after that. So yes, I did, what, I did get to meet him. What a giant in the Catholic faith uh, for all of you there at Notre Dame to um, recognize and to learn from. And again, how fortunate uh, the campus is to have that legacy. Absolutely. So uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. If there's one more question or comment that somebody wants to raise their hand. Oh, here we go. Um, let's see. Oh, people are just thanking, thanking you, Doug. Several people are posting thank yous for providing a forum for dialogue, for sharing your story and your perspectives. Um, yeah, a lot of well wishes and thank yous are coming in the chat. Thanks to um, Eric for... Uh putting me through this. I, I, I look forward to coming, you know, this COVID thing has kept us all at arm's length, but I look forward to returning to, to uh, Notre Dame and just to uh, enjoy Eric's company. We had a wonderful reunion uh, two years ago, I guess it was. So this has been great for me, a real soul booster as it were. Yeah, for me too. Um, I'm so happy um, that you came. Thank you for your wisdom. Um, your knowledge, your experiences. Thank you for writing this book. Um, people can email you. Your, your email is right there on your, on your picture. And, uh, or you can email me for more information. And I, I do have a few books available. I promised one already, but um, I have some, some other books that I would be gladly share um, with you if maybe like five people want to email me to get a book. Um, I'll lend it to you under the circumstances with the agreement that you would pass it after you read it, pass it on to somebody else. That way we can um, all have access to it. And then Doug will send more. So um, yeah, again, Doug, thank you so much for all that you've done. You're retired now and here you are <laughs> still, um, you know, still educating people and making a difference. So um, I'm very fortunate to have you as a colleague and as a, as a friend. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's have one more round of applause. A Notre Dame thank you uh, for Doug Botter. Thanks, Eric. A pleasure. We'll be in touch. Thank you all. Look for the next thing coming up. We'll be in touch. Have a great afternoon.